Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and today we're going to be taking a look at a Flat Earther who, when I first saw his videos, I thought that he was just joking. But, I mean, he's been around for over a year at this point. So sure, it is possible that he's still joking, but eventually you do get tired of that kind of stuff. Of course, the person that we're going to be looking at today is someone called KCD Industry, also known as Caleb.fe, depending on what platform you're on. It is constantly, zealotlessly, religiously repeated by the heliocentric side that solar and lunar eclipses suggest that their model is correct. Today, we're going to expand on that and completely destroy that ideology. Well, they do in fact suggest that the Earth is a ball, considering that solar eclipses are caused by the moon, and the moon reflects the sun's light, so in order to get a lunar eclipse, there has to be something in between the sun and the moon. Now, you could try to say, oh, but there's a thing in the sky that blocks it, that we've never seen. Or you could say, well, it's the Earth, because the Earth exists. If the Earth doesn't exist, then I don't know where we're living. I want you to notice when I play this live stream, what direction the celestial body that goes in front of the sun is moving. And ask yourself, does the moon ever move like this? If you were fortunate enough, which I was, and I was actually in the path of totality as well, if you watch the solar eclipse, the node, definitely not the moon, came from top to bottom. When do we ever see the moon move vertically in the sky? Literally every day that you can see the moon, it moves vertically in some fashion. If it didn't at all move vertically, then it would never set and never rise because it has to move vertically in order to be able to do that. Whenever I've watched the moon, and I watch it a lot, it only moves horizontally in the sky for some reason. But I'm supposed to believe when I watch with my own eyes that solar eclipse, the moon move from top to bottom over the sun? <laughs> that never happens. Debunking the heliocentric claim that it's the moon in the first place. Well, what do you mean by up and down? And what do you mean by horizontally? Because, you know, it would make sense if you're using something like east to west and west to east or north to south but it doesn't make any sense just using up and down it would be kind of like if i was trying to tell someone where i live and i said oh yeah just go right right from where <laughs> using directions like north south east and west would probably be a little bit easier still not great directions but it works for the analogy but here's the thing during some eclipses there is actually a bit of north south movement of the eclipse. And the reason for this is actually due to the tilt of the Earth. Because you see, the Earth actually has a tilt of about 23 degrees, which can affect the path of a solar eclipse. This is because where the Moon is in its orbit, and the orientation of North and South in respect to that orbit, can affect the perceived path that the Moon takes throughout the sky. This affects the path of the Moon during a solar eclipse. And here's a fun fact, the closer to the equinox that the solar eclipse occurs, the greater the north-south movement of the moon is likely to be. And this happens because the Earth is a globe. That's a fun little bit of globe evidence that I hadn't considered before, and you want to know what another fun bit of globe evidence is? Solar eclipses are more common during the summer. Now you may be wondering, well, what hemisphere's summer are we talking about, north or south? And it's whatever hemisphere the solar eclipse is occurring in. As I said, fun bit of globe evidence, this is because of the tilt of the Earth. Of course, you could still have a tilted Earth if the Earth were flat, but I don't think flat Earthers would take too kindly to that idea. Now, when talking about eclipses, you already know we're gonna bring up the Selenillion Eclipse, or rather coined, the Impossible Eclipse, because it's impossible on the heliocentric model. I mean, I've only ever seen Flat Earthers really try to call it that, so the name isn't exactly taking off. If you try to incorporate it into, I don't know, vegan cheese marketing, then you might get somewhere. In fact, I would totally try Impossible Eclipse Cheese, mostly because if someone names a cheese that, then they're probably watching my channel. Just as long as it's not blue cheese or any of the cheeses that I don't like, I'm actually surprisingly picky now that I think about it. This eclipse is a lunar eclipse phenomenon where we see the sun and the moon both above the horizon. And guess what? It's not rare. It happens frequently with lunar eclipses. Again, the globe side fallaciously assumes that refraction is causing all of this. You just have to believe, just believe that the images of the sun and the moon are being refracted thousands of miles into the sky, looking completely physical. 
I mean, refraction does occur. We've known about refraction for thousands of years. And I'm not just talking about, oh, refraction in water or glass. No, we have known about atmospheric refraction for thousands of years. He also tried to make a point about, oh, they still look like solid objects after they've been refracted. And yes, that is how lenses work. Like, the reason why I'm not a blurry mess right now is because my camera lens refracts light. I did try to take the lens off to prove a point, but uh, my camera wasn't too happy with me doing that. My point was, though, that refraction can indeed leave something looking like a completely solid object. And funnily enough, flat earthers seem to believe that refraction leaves things looking somehow a little bit more solid. At least, that's what it seems like they think based on the black swan. As you can see, there are serious problems with claiming that lunar and solar eclipses suggest we're on a ball revolving around the sun. There are so many anomalies with these eclipses and the heliocentric model claim, none of them line up when you actually critically look at the data given to us. Well, I've looked at the data given to us and when you take everything into consideration, it makes perfect sense. Maybe you're just missing something. But here's the thing about the Flat Earth Claim. In fact, what even is the Flat Earth Claim? That there's something else blocking the sun and the moon? Something that we have never observed? Something that only blocks out the sun during a new moon and only blocks out the moon during a full moon? That's awfully convenient, isn't it? Anyway, this video is kind of short so far, so let's take a look at another one of Caleb's videos. By now, everyone's gotta know. NASA is the number one consumer of helium annually every year. They consume about 75 million cubic feet. Where is all this helium going? Well, it's actually used for quite a few things. Like it's an inert gas, so it can be used for decontamination without reacting with any of the chemicals that might be present. It's also used as a coolant. It's also a pretty light gas, so if you need to have a balloon high up in the atmosphere, it can be pretty useful for, I see where you're going with that. And here some people might have thought that you're asking the question genuinely. Obviously not me, clearly. Oh, they're admittedly launching satellites with balloon technology. Are they launching satellites though? Or are they just launching instruments that don't really need to be all that high up to function? As it turns out, they don't actually need to send everything to space because sending everything to space can be quite expensive. Only send to space what needs to be sent to space. I know, it's hard. It's hard to not believe that metal the size of cars are just being dropped off in a space vacuum and doing magical geodesics and geostationary orbits and polaral orbits. I know it's hard, but delete all of that from your brain. It doesn't exist. Okay, using the logic, if you can call it that, that you're trying to use to say that satellites don't exist, let's apply it to something else. You see, the way that they say that microwaves work is by sending out microwaves to heat up the food. However, I've got an oven which an element just heats up in it and that heats up the food. So therefore, microwaves don't work in the way that they say. You see, that is the exact same kind of logic. Just because NASA sends up balloons, that doesn't mean that they can't also send up satellites. Hopefully I didn't accidentally make him think that microwaves aren't real. Actually, I probably did do that, didn't I? Everything that goes up must come down unless there is a force acting upon it to keep it in the sky, such as helium. I mean, he's trying to make it sound as though that's a law of physics. It's not. Things that go up generally do come down, yes. But that's because of gravity. If you manage to get something to escape velocity, you might not be getting that thing back. People all over this level plane are finding satellites tethered to balloons crashing down to the Earth. Balloons carrying scientific instruments do come down sometimes, yes. That doesn't mean that satellites are fake. And we have projects like Project Loon and Project Echo where Google and NASA admit to still using balloon technology in 2023. Again, sometimes using balloons is a lot more efficient and can be cheaper. Especially for Google, where the whole objective of a company is to try and make a profit. Though NASA does still have to fit within a budget. They don't get unlimited money like some flat earthers might believe. If we had thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth, why in the hell would we still be using balloon technology? But you're thinking, or tinfoil caps on. Because of cost, obviously, sometimes you don't need something in space, it can just be up in the stratosphere, and you don't want to spend all the money to actually send something into space. Satellites, in the ideology that is permitted and perpetuated by NASA, does not exist. Every time we see a satellite, 
it is tethered to a balloon. Okay, well, what's that then? Because that is a photo of the ISS taken by my good friend Dave McKeegan, and there's no balloon. Not to mention that it was also traveling way too fast to be propelled by balloon, so there's that as well. And it's not like that's the only photo of the ISS taken from Earth. There have been photos of the ISS taken transiting the moon or the sun. Also, whenever you see NASA or SpaceX doing any of these rocket launches, there's a reason they do a geodesic out like this. Missile launch trajectory, rocket launch trajectory, okay? They're not going around the Earth to get the gravitational swing out into space. Space doesn't exist, people. So if you know any of the physics involved, it's actually very difficult to try and send something straight up. It's much better to try and work with gravity rather than trying to totally go against gravity. The more you work with gravity, the less fuel that you have to use, and you can't just put unlimited fuel on a rocket. And the easiest way to work with gravity is to simply get yourself into an orbit. I say simply like it's a very easy thing. But get yourself into orbit and then push yourself out of that orbit. A vacuum of 10 to the negative 17 tor cannot coexist next to a high pressure system like our atmosphere without a container. Okay, Caleb, let me ask you a question. Can a pressure of, let's say, half an atmosphere exist next to our atmosphere without a container? If it can, then why? If not, well, you're just wrong because it does actually exist. There's a reason it takes like 15 foot thick concrete walls to simulate a vacuum of 10 to the negative six door. Globers, if you don't know what I'm saying, use the dictionary. It's out there for you guys to just Google the words that I'm saying instead of just saying, nuh uh. Okay, Caleb, if you do end up seeing this, I sure hope your response to what you're seeing here isn't just nah-ah, because that seems to be what I get from a lot of flat earthers. Of course, if he does see it, then he might just pretend that he hasn't seen it, because there's no way for me to tell whether he's seen it or not. Of course, there are ways to try and let him know. He has Twitter. I know some people have Twitter out there still. Anyway, that happens to be it for this video, so leave a like and subscribe if you like this video, and leave a comment letting me know what you'd like to see me do in future videos. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons, Hugh Jars, N.C. Nutkin, Maury, Nathaniel Muller, Vermont1777, Tony C, Rosanna Keller, Wolfie, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell, definitely not NASA, Craig D'Amelio, Richard M. Chapman, Kaylee, and Fist Wizard. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. And I also just started a Buy Me a Coffee, so there'll be a link to that in the description. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.